Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're going to be discussing a set of interesting pictures sent over by a potential client after we were discussing some issues he's been having with his 3-axis CNC router. What makes this video so unique, I feel, is the fact that he purchased this unit with the controller, and you can see here we see Gecko drives, from a U.S. manufacturer still currently doing business in the States today. I cannot emphasize enough to you guys that you need to be careful before laying your money out. You need to answer the right questions for yourself because if you don't do it and you don't ask these questions and get the correct answers that you're looking for, you will suffer the consequences. This potential client is now looking at replacing a controller mainly because it was just done incorrectly from the start. There's a lot of issues with this. We're going to go through it. You can see here I have a black box over the company's uh, name of who's actually sold this controller to the client. And the reason I'm doing that is this is for educational purposes. I look at it this way. You guys are smart enough or should be smart enough to really, really put the time in before laying out $5,000 plus. This potential client did. He actually went through uh, numerous manufacturers in the States. He went back and forth. He seemed to get good answers when he asked the questions. The issues that I feel are, are rising is that the questions that are being asked are not the questions that someone in this industry would look at. So what I'm trying to do with this video is I want you guys <clears throat> to ask or give yourself an idea of what questions to ask. Make a list of these questions and speak to a vendor. If you're, if you're dead set on building a system yourself, it's time to speak to these vendors and hold them accountable by asking them the correct set of questions. Okay, we're going to go through now and you can see this system is, you know, wire management, of course, is out the window, but there's a lot of other issues here. As we go through these pictures, we're going to discuss them one by one. Okay, let's look at this system <clears throat> very closely now. You can see here, we're going to start up at the top left corner. You can see here we have a three-point terminal block. One of the biggest issues when using a terminal block is you want to make sure that if you have multiple connectors going to the terminal block that all need to be on that same pin, you should be using a splitter. That's the correct process to do. You don't piggyback quick connects in order to do this. Why I'm saying that? Because some guys out there are going, well, you're being anal. No, I'm not being anal. It's just I understand the type of electronics we're dealing with here. Okay, we're not wiring, you know, your car stereo. We're wiring a precision set of electronics that you're hoping will yield precision type products. In order to do that, you want to take out all the variables and overbuild any possible situation that can yield an unstable system. I hope I've made that perfectly clear. I've said this in previous videos, but I want to emphasize this. When I see Quick Connects being used, especially from a vendor, it tells me two things. It tells me, number one, they're lazy, and number two, it tells me that they want to get the system out the door as fast as possible. Okay. It also tells me that usually crappy engineering is involved because they're not taking the time to look at ways to integrate soldering that would streamline their build process along with also looking at you know what this system can do as far as having all your connectors hooked up now you, you look over here on your input you can see we have insulated quick connects which is actually that's the right thing to do if you're going to use them they should always be insulated on every terminal I'll say that again every terminal inside your controller should be properly insulated why well let's look at this from a logical perspective if you ever have to work on your controller yourself which I'm assuming you will because unless you're planning on mailing it back to the original vendor you're going to have to service it eventually, you should be incorporating as many safety features as possible when we're dealing around electric. Now, whether you're in the States or you're overseas, if you're overseas, it's even more critical because you guys usually run in 220. You don't want to play with lethal voltages. There's no reason for it. Heat shrink is cheap, and there's other variables here I want to discuss. So once again, quick connects are fine if you're doing other type electrical work. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you do not use them when fabricating your CNC controller. They each quick connect use will increase electrical resistance. As electrical resistance increases, your equipment becomes more susceptible to EMI interference, which is electromagnetic interference. I've discussed this numerous times. 
If that electromagnetic interference grows at a capacity that's greater than what the equipment can withstand, you will find that your system will, will yield what's known as ghosting. I've termed that. Okay, and ghosting is simply where the machine is doing what it wants to do, regardless of what you do. And as far as your programming goes, the machine will stop, cut, stutter, stammer, missteps. It can go on and on. So what you guys have to realize is for this lack of effort, and that's all I consider it to be is lack of effort. He used the proper terminal block. He just didn't want to use the correct size terminal block. It certainly wouldn't have cost more to the vendor, but it would have taken more time to do the soldering, of course, like I stated in the engineering this is what we have here, okay? As we go through this system, you can see, now this is where I find it really interesting. You can see here we have insulated connectors coming from our, our power input. Yet over here, we have no insulation here on a bolt-through connector. And if we come on this side, I can't zoom in over here too much, let's see. If I come over here, you can see that we have bare leads on these terminals over here as well. Now, one of the things I want to tell you guys is that when you actually see these type of connectors being used on this side, let me just zoom out now. When you see these type of connectors being used, a lot of guys are saying, well, how do you insulate that, you know, on a bolt through connector? Okay. The idea of using insulation is, is that once again, we're, we're providing ourselves a line of safety, but by the same token, if you use your head and you think that there's other ways, because I know a lot of guys are saying, I can't use heat shrink then don't use heat shrink, use liquid electrical tape. It's UL listed, you can purchase it at Home Depot or Lowe's, it goes on, you put a light coat on it, it's basically liquid rubber, and it insulates the connector. If you have to remove it, it just peels off, it's very simple to remove, but at least your connections are insulated, okay? That is the proper process when you're building anything electronic, especially something you're gonna be servicing, safety should always come first, okay? <clears throat> As we go through here, we can see we have a fuse, looks like an internal fuse panel actually mounted to the base of the metal chassis. Once again, we have insulated quick connects used here, okay? This fuse panel that's mounted to the base of this chassis is frightening. And what's really frightening about it is when I show you where this controller is mounted, you're gonna find out why I feel it's actually very scary. When I see the same fuse panel used over here to protect our drives, the thing to remember, guys, and, and regardless of even if the controller wasn't mounted in the vicinity of where it is in reference to the chassis, I would highly recommend using inline fuse with the nylon actual casing that goes around the fuse. If you're going to do that, you want to go to that length, that is the proper way to do it. Okay. Another simple method would have been to use a redundant fuse in the chassis itself, one for the drives and one for the actual power input. He could have easily done that as well. Regardless. This is what he chose to do, and with this being mounted once again to the chassis, it's, it's just scary where this chassis, the actual enclosure for the controller is mounted in reference to the chassis, and, I, and once again, when you see it, you'll understand. You can see over here as we go through this, we've got Ethernet cables because he's got a PMDX, it looks like a PMDX interface board for the drives. He's using Ethernet plugs to the G021, or excuse me, G201X drives, and basically, if we look here on the casing, you can see there's no text that references anything regarding shielding. So we can honestly say that these Ethernet cords, why they make everything neat, or would have, if you would have taken the time to do the wire management that he should have, what he should have done is make sure that these are shielded cables because they are, once again, holding your step and direction signals. So let me reiterate something I've said in numerous videos. The topic keeps coming up over and over again. If anything in your system, whatever in your system that's electronic is carrying a signal, shielded cables should be properly used. And properly used means that you actually have a ground bar installed in your chassis along with the proper ground drain coming off the shield of the shielded cable being used. It does not mean simply using shielded cable. Point in reference. Let's look right here real quick. We could see a shielded cable here being used with the shield itself exposed, no drain coming off of this because whoever assembled this system lacked the knowledge and forethought to say, well, the cable is just acting as a cable if we don't have a shield drain actually attached to a ground in the chassis. So therefore, this is essentially just another cable. If we identify over here and look at these terminal blocks, you can see we actually have three conductors 
going into one terminal block, guys. Over here, you've got two conductors going into this terminal block. And what's really interesting is the more we zoom in and take a gander at this, you can see your conductors aren't even fully inserted inside the terminal block. Now, when I speak of details, this is the kind of details that will yield poor results overall on performance of your system. And why is that? Because if, if you have a terminal block that is not making full contact with any of these conductors, you will get erratic performance. You will get EMI penetration. These are things that make your system unstable. Take the time and do it right. Once again, this potential client thought he was doing it right by going to a so-called professional. You guys need to learn the first question. You need to ask any, any system vendor who is selling an integrated system with controller, chassis, and everything. You want to see pictures of everything. Everything. And I mean the controller. You want to see past clients' controllers. I want to see the wiring. I want to see how it's done. I want to know who built it. If they tell you a third-party vendor built it, you want to know who he is. There's nothing wrong with asking these questions. This, this potential client dropped over five grand on this system. That is a ridiculous amount of money to have to rebuild an entire controller just because of lack of detail and honestly an ignorance to the actual context of what he's building. And we can see that right here. There is no way. I mean, if this individual went on a Gecko's website, and actually did the research on, on actually wiring the drives, the, one of the first things they talk about is daisy chaining. This is totally inadept for wiring this system. You should never, ever, ever be having multiple actual leads going into one terminal block. You use a terminal splitter, you wire one lead from the terminal block, and then attach these multiple leads to a terminal block that's used as a splitter. That is the correct process to do. OK, and when it's done that way, not only does it look neater, your system is done correctly for servicing and also the performance is bulletproof. And when I say bulletproof, if you cover all these bases with these type of details, you guys will be left with a perfect system in the sense that you've done everything in your capability to make sure the stability is there. That is something that all of you want. But what I see online is where guys are not or they're either too proud or they're just, I can't even think of another word other than ignorant, to say, I can't do this, I need to take a step back. Or what, which is the best way to do this? A vendor that's supposed to be a professional selling this is absolutely awful. I don't know what else to say. As a matter of fact, as we zoom in here, we can keep going. Look at this. We see more bare conductors sticking out of this quick connect terminal block. Once again, when you guys insert any conductors inside a terminal block, you should see absolutely no conductor present. It should be nothing but casing. This way you're assured that you're getting full conductivity whenever that terminal block is fastened. Okay. As we come over here, we have a 5-volt power supply. 5-volt power supplies, again, are low voltage. Low voltage means even more susceptibility to EMI. And as we look at this, you can see we have two leads coming in here to, to this terminal, once again, daisy chaining, to get the job done and get the job out the door so they can make their money. And this is not the correct way to do this. There should have been, once again, a splitter block, one terminal coming over from the power supply, use your splitter block and actually come over here and, and wire the remaining leads that need to be incorporated in the system. OK. Can't come over here yet. We'll zoom out. OK, let's let's come over here and look at our power supply setup. We can see we've got a lead here not even connected. I have no idea, nor did the potential client know what this lead was for. Um, I can't emphasize enough when you see a system using a makeshift power supply. OK, I don't care what they what terminology they want to come out with. The bottom line is this. You guys should have the simplest form of power supply integrated in your system that you understand and are able to service yourself. When you see components like this, if you don't understand how to change them, whether it be a transformer, capacitor, whatever it may be, if you don't understand it, run. Get away from it. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Take care. That's it. Because what ends up happening is, like I stated, this vendor is still in service today in the U.S. 
this is now a proprietary component as well as this. If you don't buy from them, they're not going to warranty the system. And we'll cover that a little bit later about this warranty situation. But overall, this is a much harder component to replace if you're not familiar with electronics. Safety is a huge issue, whereas the, this vendor could have chosen to use an, a typical switching power supply, 48 volts, 72 volts is all the same when it comes to output. All this, there's a lot of stuff online about using linear power supplies versus switching power supplies. Voltage is voltage, okay? 12 volts is 12 volts, 48 volts, 48 volts, so on and so forth. The big thing here is making sure that your system is properly shielded. The more shielding you have, you're gonna have utmost stability, okay? Power supplies typically are not the hindrance. Manufacturers typically incorporate these type of power supplies to make it more difficult for you, the end user to service, so that you are then liable for proprietary parts. That basically secures their business model. I'm telling you now, coming from this industry, that is what it is. There's no reason that they could not have used a switching power supply. Okay, so once again, if you're okay with this, there are some end users who are more advanced with electronics and are okay seeing this being used, go for it. OK, the old debate of which power supply is better because one's supposed to be, you know, give you a, a less line fluctuation, this, that and the other thing. If you want to argue that fact, that's totally up to you. I'm arguing the fact I look for simplicity because I'm a realist in the sense of what I deal with in real world situations. And in real world situations, when you find a switching power supply has four bolts that need to be removed, it comes with a casing, it's simple to remove by an end user, he can replace it in and out within 25 to 30 minutes if the engineering is properly done on the enclosure, that makes a hell of a lot more sense than using individual electronic components to yield a power supply. So hopefully that makes sense to all of you. And I can't make it any more clear than that. If we, if we now actually look at the drives, we're going to come over here. Um, let's go to the next picture. This isn't showing too much. Well, actually, yeah, it is. If we come down here again, this is just amplifying what we've already discussed. Once again, conductors. Here we go. We've got two conductors going into the quick connect terminal block. Wrong. You've got a conductors here that are present that are not fully inserted, showing the actual casing of the wire, not, not all the way bottomed out, wrong. Once again, here as well. As we go through, let's zoom out again. Okay. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. As we look at this system, okay, You notice here all these leads coming into your motors. These are your motor leads going out. You can see we've got Quick Connects. Once again, he insulated these. Right here, you see no shielding being done at all. Those are all your step and direction signals going to your motors. Guys, that's the heart of the system. Okay, you've got over here, you can see we've got multiple Quick Connects being used. And once again, I'm sure there's multiple. Matter of fact, right here and here, looks like there's two coming out of that once again, instead of using the terminal block to actually split everything. He didn't even cut. I mean, whoever this person was, this is amazing. He did not even take the time to cut the wire ties level with the base. I mean, guys, I don't know about you, but to me, that is ridiculously lazy. I don't even know where to go with that. It's frightening, especially when you're using these kind of components. I mean, actually, the components chosen here are fine. I mean, it's not the components at fault. It's the fact that we just have poor build quality. There's no attention to detail at all, no attention to the fact that you're dealing with a precision piece of electronics. And that's exactly the way it should be taken care of. But when I see this, like I said, when I see here, you can see the quick connects are insulated and you have no shielding at all on these motor, motor outputs. What you're basically doing is inviting in the potential for EMI. Now, let's look at the facts here. If these are not shielded, most likely the Ethernet cables are not shielded. Nothing in this chassis is shielded. When I show you the location, let's go over there and show you the location. When I show you the location, matter of fact, this is basically the same picture. Actually, here, this is another good picture, and it, and evalu it, it evaluates exactly what I was saying. Let's look at the conductors here. Right here, conductor, and that's your power conductor. That's your negative on your power supply, not fully inserted at all. Casing is still visible. You can see the copper. That's another thing, guys. I'm going to tell you right now, and this is my own personal opinion. Everybody's varies. 
I like to tin all my leads that are going into an actual terminal block. Now, there are a lot of different methods as far as how that goes. This is my personal opinion, okay? With these terminal blocks that Gecko uses and so many other vendors use, you're not supposed to be using that kind of pressure when you apply a, an actual lead inside of it, okay? And you're, you're certainly not servicing the unit on a daily basis where you're removing, going back in and removing. You can, of course, use for rules. That's fine. For rules are really designed to be used when you're removing things on a more regular basis. If you're constantly removing things, you're gonna have issues. Tinning cables work out extremely well, especially when you're using about a, a, an 18 gauge to 16 gauge cable, you're fine, okay? As long as you're not actually tightening these bolts like you're tightening lug nuts on your BMW, you're gonna be perfect, okay? I can't emphasize that enough, but when I see here that these leads aren't even fully inserted in the terminal block, that is, it's frightening, especially considering these are the drives. Look at this. Same thing here, 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 here. We have no idea if all these terminals are working correctly. Yet over here, this one's fine. Well, none of these are correct. It's just baffling to me. It really, really is baffling to me. So that's why I'm telling you, these details, all of these details, taking away from everything that I'm saying now, all of these details done that way, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, will basically eliminate any possibility of you saying, well, I don't know if I did that. I don't know if I made this the, you know, that exact way. That is why I'm covering these details with you. If you get pictures from a guy saying, hey, I can build your control, look at this, and this is what you see, I'm sorry, sir, thank you, take care for your time. That's what you guys need to understand. Because if you have to go through here or I have to go through there and you say to me, and this comes to me a lot, this question, um, well, how much would it cost for you to you know, rebuild the controller for me? Guys, that's a full rebuild what you're seeing here, okay? I mean, all these cables need to be shielded. The grounds need to be installed. I mean, basically, you want me to rewire the entire system. That's the first thing. The second thing is I don't warranty any work from anybody else because I don't know the components that they've chosen. Now here I see Gecko drives, that's fine. But the rest of this stuff, I have no idea where he got or what, what kind of warranty he actually installed in the system that it actually came for for the client. I have no idea of that. So again, I don't warranty any work unless I do it myself. So when I'm asked that question, I tell the potential client the same thing or I'll tell you the same thing. I have to start over. The interesting part about this system is whoever this vendor is, and once again, um, you guys will do your research, it'll eventually come out, you'll know right away they weren't even intelligent enough to realize they don't need to use pro-grade drives on a three-foot chassis. Let me say that again. They're using pro-grade drives on a three-foot chassis. The G540 is more than capable of doing that, more than capable of going four foot, five foot, six foot. I'm telling you now, when you have proper engineering and you have people who understand what they're selling, they will be able to guide you that way. You know, whether you come to me or whether you go to someone else, get the right service that you're paying for. You know, that's the whole idea of what this is about. That's why I'm doing the videos because I know there's going to be one guy out there who's going to listen to what I'm saying and it's going to save him. That's why I'm taking the time to do this. Now we come over here. Let's see if I can get back out of here. Okay. Now, I spoke to you about the location of the actual chassis in reference to the controller. This controller came with this chassis and it's integrated. What you see here is a bottom plate that has all of those electronics mounted on it underneath his metal chassis. Okay, with no shielding, of course. Look at the motor cables. None of that. We'll zoom in real close because I want to make sure that everybody can see this. Okay, none of this is shielded at all. None of it. Look, and you can see here where the cables are actually, or the, I should say the conductors are going in the uh, casing. You don't see any aluminum or any metallic color whatsoever. So I can tell you right now, there's definitively no shielding being used on this system at all. Okay, when we see that, you can guarantee that this system is, is no longer playing with fire. It's literally on fire. Okay, you have an all-metal chassis mounted with a metal base plate 
with the actual drives on it and all the sensitive electronics with no shielding mounted directly under the chassis to make it look ergonomic and cool. Guys, it's not about making it look ergonomic and cool at the expense of stability. The machine looks beautiful but can't cut worth a crap, you're screwed. <laughs> That's the easiest way to say it. That's what these guys do. They like to make their system, oh, look at my system, it's ergonomic. Great. That's great. How does it cut? And I don't mean for an hour. I mean for 10 hours, 15 hours. If it's not stable, you guys are going backwards. You'll be on the phone. You'll be pulling your hair out. And believe me, this, this potential client is at his wit's end. And that's why I'm telling you, be careful. Okay? When I see this, and once again, I see that this plate is mounted under the chassis. At that point, when I seen this picture, I already knew what this, this potential client is dealing with. Okay, this whole chassis is basically an ornament because if he can't cut a circle, if he's having missteps and he's having different issues, it's going to cause problems all over the place. And I cannot say to you guys enough that you got to ask the right questions. When you contact these vendors, you have to make sure that you're explicit. I want to know who built the system. I want to see pictures of it. I want to see the system run. I want to see a client system running and working. And if I were you, I would definitely request to speak to a client, which should be no problem. It's no different than if you go for a job interview and they ask for references. Ask them, hey, can I speak to one of your clients about the system? Do you have any you know, clients that are using the system? And if you're using it for business or planning to, you should definitely speak to a, a separate entity as far as who they sold to to find out how they like the system. Because I'm telling you now, so many of these vendors are popping up online. It's scary. It's scary. If you Google search CNC automation or CNC router or CNC water jet or plasma jet, you're going to find tons of all types of vendors. The interesting part, and again, I tell you guys all the time, no contact number, run. If you see an email, and right, let me let me rephrase that. I'll, I'll be I'll be more genuine with that in the sense that if you see just an email and you contact the email and say, I'd like to speak to you on the phone about your system, and you get an email back stating, here's my number, let's talk. It might be a really new site and they just haven't actually incorporated a phone number yet. That's a different story. I can tell you, though, without a doubt, that's very rarely the case. Typically, when that website is up, they've already got you know, their mitts in the ground, so to speak, as far as ready to make sales. That's what they go to do. Okay, A lot of these sites I read, and they'll say things like, oh, I was going to build myself a system, and so I built it myself, and then I decided, wow, there's other guys that want this, and of course, that's where the business starts. Well, that's fine. The problem is there's not ample testing being done. They don't test them in, a, in an actual manufacturing environment, whether it be micro, that, their other. And what ends up happening is you, the client, get screwed because you're buying a guy's one-off that typically has no research involved. You don't know if that guy's an engineer, if he even has a team of engineers, or even people that are mechanically inclined for that matter. Be cautious, guys. Be cautious. The Internet is the Wild West. Once your money is out, you'd much rather be on the other end saying, I want to ask the right questions and walking away than giving $5,000 to the wrong person and hoping to get it back or hoping to get the system running correctly. Okay. Another key point with this system I want to make, which is something that is totally unique, this system uses, if you can see it down here, I really can't zoom in much. I'll try. Okay. I guess I can. Okay. You can see we've got a pulley here, a pulley here, motor in the center of the chassis, and we're splitting with a differential the, for both axes on his Y so that he's basically getting away with not doing a slave axis. Guys, this is probably one of the, the worst setups I've ever seen on a CNC router to split a slave axis. I am not a big fan of slave axis, however... And when I say that, I'm really not a fan more towards novices. There are more, it's much more setup intrusive to have a slave axis to make sure everything is correlated properly. That being said, it's inevitable when your table is large enough. When I see things like this, he could have easily just went with a simple ball screw down the center of the table and done away with all this crap. These, this pulley, it looks more or less like a pulley used on a, a 3D printer. 
And of course, the client already told me he's having issues with this lead screw over here. Um, this particular chassis even uses Delrin as far as, I guess, as a uh, ball screw coupler, so to speak. Uh, after doing some research, guys, if you have plastic going to a lead screw, run. That's all I'm going to tell you. Run. That is definitely not best practice. You always have, this is the transmission of your chassis. You want to make sure that it is done properly. That's the whole automation of your chassis. And that's why I'm telling you guys, do the research. Ask the questions. Ask the questions. After I spoke to the client, this is another interesting point. After I spoke to the client, I asked him, I said, what size motor are you using underneath the chassis? So he gave me a part number. It's a 570-ounce motor. Um, and it's funny because it's rated at 3.5 amps, which is great because we can do a G540 retrofit. It certainly saves the client money. And on top of that, looking at the drives he chose, he's using prograde drives that are only requiring motors, or excuse me, the motors are only requiring 3.5 amps on a drive that supports up to 7. That is a complete waste of money guys it's a ploy to take more of your money okay there is no reason in doing that i'm all for overbuilding the system if the performance is going to be there if it can be seen it's worth it if it cannot be seen it's not automation is automation especially when you're using gecko drives if we're dealing with a gecko g540 and you're going to a g201 the only difference is going to be is that g201 is really designed for larger motors that require more amps in your case that is, there's no reference to it. This is silly. The vendor chose those drives because, once again, they either wanted to have a, a way to venue the price and adjust it to what they seen fit, which I truly don't believe. I personally believe it's ignorance because I can't figure out why they would do that. They made more work for themselves. And you can tell from how they wired the system, it didn't make sense to choose not shielding everything, using Quick Connects, all the easy way outs. Hell, even your motor connectors here, the motor wires. Let's see if I can zoom in again. Even it looks like your motor, even your motor cables right here, you could see these are buck connectors. So, I mean, they really wanted to get this thing out the door as soon as possible. And that being said, if they would have did more research or hell, even call Gecko, I, I'm sure that they would have guided them correctly. Because to see this, it just blows my mind that they would have, you know, justify their price by putting the G201s in. And that's why I don't feel that's the case. I just feel that they're just ignorant to the fact they could have used a, a, a better solution that was more cost effective. It would also make their system sell a lot more, being it would lower the price curve. Once again, I'm not here to discuss their business model. I'm here to discuss what exactly you guys have to watch out for. And this is just, like I said, there's, a, there's so many red flags here. It's frightening. Okay. Needless to say, you guys have now enough knowledge, I'm hoping, after watching all these videos, going through and validating exactly what I'm telling you. Because, again, who am I? Don't take my word for it. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. I'm trying to let you guys in on what is happening now with this industry. As years have gone by, and I've been doing this now um, full-time, online, for at least now five years or seven years, I'm sorry, and doing it online that long, I can tell you without a doubt that I have seen a mass influx of all these fly-by-night vendors. This particular vendor is not. He's actually been online for quite some time. The unfortunate part is, is that the more guys come forward and say, hey, I have problems, and they contact the vendor, and then the vendor says to him, oh, well, apparently my uh, this potential client contacted the vendor about the lead screw issue, and the, the vendor basically said nothing about replacing it. Uh, it's something to do with your with Mach 3 setup, guys. That I mean, you got there's a point you got to use logic too. I mean, if you find that they're giving you that kind of runaround, I that's why I say go over these systems left and right. If you have to dismantle them, check every nut, check every bolt. Again, this potential client when he received the system, he found all he found a couple uh, loose bolts on it. Uh, he couldn't get a circle to cut symmetrically. He kept cutting out an oval pattern. He contacted the vendor again, and the vendor gave him another runaround. Oh well, you know, probably loosened up in shipping. Come on, we have to be we have to be real here, okay? These tables weigh about two, three hundred pounds. That's usually not the case, okay? Just be careful. I'm hoping that this video finds the right person who's been on the edge, 
looking at spending this kind of money and then they found the video and it saved them from making poor choices. Ask the right questions, inform yourself. I should not have to tell you what vendor this is if you guys ask the right questions. You'll find out just by asking the right questions. I want to see who well, I want to see my system. I want to see what you guys are building. I want to look at the electronics. What electronics are you using? What drives are you using? What power supply? You, you can ask as many questions as you want. They should be readily available with all the answers. All the answers. Who do I speak to if I have a problem? Do I speak to you, the owner, or do I speak to, you know, do you have an engineer on staff, technician? How does this work? What kind of what kind of warranty is installed? When you guys buy these turnkey systems, unless they're overseas, where of course warranties overseas, you should all know there's no warranty. I would always assume anything overseas has no warranty. When you purchase a system in the US, however, if it's fully inclusive, including a controller and everything, that is very common to get between a six month to a one year warranty. Now it may not be on all the parts because with automation there's no way for them to dictate what parts will wear based on what applications you're using it for. That's, that's a legit reason. However, when you drop five grand, if I'm putting 5K in a system, I wanna know that my investment is sound. Okay, I have to make back the ROI on this investment or else it's useless unless you're a guy who just wants to, you know, cut widgets in his basement. Most guys dropping that kind of coin, they look at, okay, I'm investing this for a business model and that's a substantial amount of money. I need to have, you know, that return on my investment and I need to be able to plan for it. If in the event something happens, I have backup. So, again, find out about a warranty if you're purchasing in the U.S., Find out and only on inclusive systems. You're not going to get warranties typically on, you know, if you buy a stepper motor from me, I can give you a warranty if I get direct replacement, meaning you would get a direct replacement from me based upon how long you've had the motor because then I get replaced. There's no way we lose money as vendors if we have our proper business model in place with our vendors. They reimburse us the parts. That's why I always ask you guys, if something fails, send me the part back because then I get reimbursed. Okay, we're not here to screw anybody. We're here to make money honestly, or we should be. That's why I'm saying ask the right questions, do the right thing. Overall, you guys have a lot of information to digest. Watch this video over again. Go over everything again with me as I've been discussing everything. If you have a system now, double check your system doesn't have any of these problems that this one has. If you notice any type of leads that are not fully inserted in your terminal block, if anything is loose, go over the screw set. When you see this base plate mounted to the bottom of the chassis, guys, you have a spindle on top of this chassis that's pulling the most amount of amps. That spindle will generate large amounts of EMI, essentially turning this metal chassis and everything connected that's metal into an antenna, which, which just translates all that to your wires. They start talking to each other, and you're screwed when it comes to signals. So I'm telling you now, details count. Details count. You go online, you search, and I've said this before, you're going to find 98% of the forms, they're not guys discussing, oh, hey, man, I'm cutting today. Check this out. This is what I made. No, it's not that. It's all about problems. It's all, it's all issues is what it is, and that's why so many issues exist. If it was just connect wire point A to point B, you wouldn't have that. That's why I'm doing the videos. There's a lot more to this than saying, hey, I can assemble an erector set and make it move. You guys got to understand there's a lot of information here that needs to be gone over, and the setup involved is so critical for the end result to be as perfect as possible. So, again, I hope this has helped you guys. I hope you guys... Um, really gain something out of this. And like I said, if it helps the one guy out there who's on the fence and, you know, looking at purchasing a system, whether it be here or overseas, you answer the questions by asking them and make sure that the vendor has the correct answers. Okay? I can't emphasize that enough. If they stammer, stutter, they don't have the correct answers, if you're not satisfied, move on. Your money is good anywhere. Spend it the right way, protect yourself, and get ahead with what your progress is with CNC. Okay? Once again, if you guys have personal questions that you want to ask, anything, I'm always there. Um, I always tell you guys to question your vendors first on, you know, wherever you're buying things. Um, that's something I, I always request that you do. If you don't get any feedback from them, again, I do do third-party support. I've been doing it now all along. So, I, again, if you're not getting any feedback there, come back to me. I'll do my best to answer your questions. Of course, I'm getting busier. So, therefore, if I don't get back to you right away, just keep that in mind. I'm not being disrespectful. Um, 
Again, my personal email is storm, S-T-O-R-M, 2313 at gmail.com. And you can also contact me through my eBay store at eDealers Direct. Um, I'll put the link in the description. You'll be all set there. And in this way, you guys have at least a chance. And that's all I can give to you. If you're not willing to put the time in and due diligence and ask the right questions, write them down, guys. Write them down. Watch the video again. Write them all down. And ask these questions. Protect yourselves. Okay? Thank you all. Take care.